Um, good afternoon. My name is Joe Burke. I'm the program director for Northern Illinois University's Art Museum. Our current exhibition running through February 26th is the NIU School of Art and Design Faculty Biennial. And in conjunction with that exhibition, we are hosting a number of virtual and hybrid faculty presentations over the next three weeks. Today's workshop and artist talk is Mindfulness Through Still Life Photography, led by NIU Associate Professor Jessica Labatt. Labatt is represented by Western Exhibitions in Chicago, and she has exhibited in the 12 by 12 New Artist New Work at the Museum of Contemporary Art and at the New Art Dealers Alliance Art Fair in Miami through Golden Gallery. She teaches photography at NIU, both traditional and digital, with courses emphasizing design, research, and field experience lighting and post-production. She studied at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and her work explores the visible and invisible, the present and withdrawn. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Labatt as we visit her studio and partake in this mindfulness workshop with her. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Joe. Um, so thanks for joining me in my studio. My studio is in Winfield, Illinois. And I thought I'd give you kind of a, a a presentation about the history of this um, way of thinking about still life in my own practice. And then we can, I can show you around and um, show you kind of my working process. So I'm gonna share a PowerPoint first. Can you see that PowerPoint? Cool. Okay, um, so, and I have, I have printed notes because I don't have a second screen here at my studio. So forgive me for this old school school uh, way of working. But um, so the, oh, this series is um, <laughs> called Almanac for Shade Gardeners. And um, this work has become a model for mindful attention and how um, I have begun to use still life as a way of creating mindfulness in my own experience. Um, there are a series of floral still lives that I started uh, in 2018. They mark impermanence in the domestic everyday space of my home and garden. It started in 2018 when I photographed every single flower that bloomed over the course of one growing season. I was thinking about marking time as the flowers would bloom and fade from one season to the next. And this has continued for year after year. So now we're in, um, approaching our fifth, my fifth season of photographing in the garden. The pictures um, incorporate involving indexes of nurturing and endless clutter of objects that accompany parenthood and artistic practice in domestic spaces. So a little bit of my backstory. Uh, in 2015, I moved to the suburbs of Chicago with my partner to accommodate my teaching job at NIU. Before then, I had been living in Chicago and I had been commuting out to DeKalb uh, four days a week. And I finally decided that I just couldn't do that, that drive anymore. We found a house in a suburb that I'd never heard of on a densely wooded lot that was previously owned by a cabinet maker. So the studio space that I'll show you in a little bit um, was the wood shop that this cabinet maker built out uh, in the 80s so that he could build cabinets. But the basement studio is wonderful. It has tall ceilings so I can use my lights. And behind the house, there are deep woods, which was something that my husband really was looking for. He had worked at an artist residency, Oxbow in Saugatuck, Michigan for 17 years where he was the head chef. And so we really like to forage for mushrooms and watch birds. As we learned to navigate this new domesticity, we found a passion of gardening together. Uh, I had always loved plants and I tended the front gardens at Roots and Culture. Uh, while, while they lived there, um, but we started to learn to garden together, which was really fun. And my students that are in my advanced class will know um, about the metaphor of the rhizome. We've been talking a lot about this as a metaphor, um, the rhizome referring to the plants that kind of shoot, up, shoot off shoots from one to the next um, so that they're all interconnected. And this has been a metaphor that's been used to describe artistic process. And I feel like it really describes how I live in the world and how my artistic um, inspiration um, comes into be my everyday life comes into be in my artistic work. Uh, so these are just pictures from my phone of things that I thought were beautiful uh, during my time of just being, being a human, not being an artist, um, you know, just taking little pictures. But I think they relate directly to my work. 
Uh, developing our gardens has been a big process. Uh, not everything is going to grow. The soil is very clay based here and we've lost a lot of plants over the years. Uh, but our biggest obstacle has been these black walnut trees. They create a, a huge, beautiful uh, tree cover. Um, but the black walnut trees, uh, they're really territorial. They have this chemical that they shoot out through their roots called juglone that can suffocate all but um, a certain kinds of plants. So as we've been learning more about this ecosystem, um, we've started to, to learn about, you know, what plants are compatible with this and, and what, what plants cannot be. Lots of squirrels enjoy the walnuts and the little seeds that they scatter across the yard leave traces of the chemicals for future seasons. So even if, you know, you're being you're mindful of the, the area around the trees, uh, there could be traces of the chemicals far beyond. So if before we moved out here, I was working on a, this series of still lives, and I think it's in, important to think about how uh, my work has always been about finding and collecting objects to photograph. So I've always been really interested in still life, and I wasn't really sure how to do that in the suburbs. These were these series were made in Chicago while I was collecting little pieces of trash, um, things I would find as I was walking to the bus stop or to to and from my studio. Um, and I wasn't really sure how to do that once we got out to the suburbs. Just a little backstory for you here. So I was really confused when I got out here because I was driving around in my car and I wasn't having that kind of immediate experience. Um, but I realized that I needed to take some of the advice that I was always giving to my students. Um, I'm always encouraging them to use what things they have around them, to use things that they have access to, you know, and really leverage those opportunities that they may have uniquely. And I realized that for me, that was my garden. So I began photographing um, and collecting things from around the yard. But I see this connection between these, these two different bodies of work. Um, and one of my friends recently asked me what I saw as the difference between trash picking and picking flowers. And I, I don't think there's much of a difference. Um, and then I found this really beautiful Thich Nhat Hanh quote. Um, for those of you that don't know, Thich Nhat Hanh was a, a, a really wonderful um, Buddhist monk. Uh, he just passed away. And, but he his teachings uh, about mindfulness have been really influential to me. And he says, without a rose, we cannot have garbage. Without garbage, we cannot have a rose. And you know, just thinking about the interconnection of materials and um, how all matter is connected and recycles is, is really exciting to me. So my first child was born in 2016 and this really signaled a major identity shift for me. I had a hard time dealing with anxieties of caring for a small infant while I was trying to have my own autonomy as an adult, as a woman, as an artist and a professor. It was immensely challenging to navigate the pressures of the tenure track teaching and building the photography curriculum and updating the facilities at NIU while I was trying to juggle my own career as an artist and a mother. Um, I felt pulled in many di different directions. And although you know we all have multi-layered identities, I found integrating this new identity as mother to be in, in conflict with the, identi the identity of artist. And um, so Elizabeth Chodos, who's a, the gallery uh, director at Carnegie Mellon, wrote a really beautiful essay for my my catalog for my exhibition of this work. And I'm gonna quote from that. She says, historically, the archetypal artist is a male who is bold, brilliant, uncompromising and independent thinker and an, and an independent thinker. Society embraces the idea of the artist as a lone wolf who is passionate, sexy and virile. By way of contrast, the stereotype for the archetypal mother is a woman who is selfless, nurturing, desexualized and only known in relation to turn relation to her children. So to combat this and all the uh, change I was experiencing and what I now know was postpartum depression, I started to incorporate mindfulness techniques into my life. Um, these techniques turned my attention to being focused in the present moment. I started paying more attention to my breathing and feeling the rootedness of my feet on the ground. Um, and while I was caretaking, uh, I would pay attention to simple yet beautiful things in the yard, little textures, um, on plants, the quality of light, you know, depending on the time of day, what room we were in the house, there would be different, you know, light, the colors and shapes in my child's toys, um, 
they would all become these places where I would spend a lot of time attentively looking and, and really focusing. So I became aware of all the beauty and the mundane objects surrounding me. And through slow, attentive looking, I began to collect, collect objects from around the house. So these were my collections, um, things that caught my attention or my child's and things that were blossoming in the garden. It was a, there was a direct connection here. And now you can see to the trash still lives I was making in the city. It, although it was hard to attend openings and lectures, I found inspiration listening to recordings and podcasts, um, which is exciting that we're able to do that here today. And in one lecture, the curator uh, Uta Meta Bauer said that she understood theorizing to be looking very intently. And this really resonated with me because I was excited about the way that looking intently and investing time um, and being really present in the moment might be a way of creating theory beyond just writing um, a written text. Um, so each of the still lives will be a collection of these flowers that was blooming at the moment and then little objects from around the house. Uh, this one, and the titles often come from different experiences of our life or, or child rearing. This one's called the witching hour. Um, for those parents out there, you know, this is the time between dinner and bedtime when the kids are just totally wound up and insane and you're just exhausted, but they're being possessed. Um, and so that's where that term comes from, is that there was a belief that your children were being witched right before uh, bedtime. Around this time, I also found this really wonderful um, book by uh, Rebecca Walker. That's one of the benefits of working at NIU and the public university system is having access to the library. And all my students know how much I love the library. I make them go every semester. Um, but through the iShare network, you can get books sent to the school from any of the um, other universities in Illinois, like the Art Institute and Columbia College and UIC. So it's a great, great resource. Um, and I found this book uh, called To Be Real, and it has this quote, the short essay by Bell Hooks called Beauty Laid Bare, Aesthetics in the Ordinary. And this essay became really influential in my studio direction as she called for um, an acknowledgement of beauty in our lives and how beauty can be a transformative experience. And so in the, in the context of the essay, she's really talking about how um, in Afro -Amer African American culture, she, she was hoping to inspire a greater appreciation of beauty, um, but I really resonated with this as well. And so the quote is, there can be a sacred place in everyone's life where beauty can be laid bare, where our spirits can be moved and lifted by, up by the creation and presence of a beautiful object. So this became like my, my motto. And I even made my students do an assignment based around this essay one semester, because I was just so excited about it. Um, so between the mindfulness techniques that I was practicing and some of the, this research that I was doing that led into um, like a more holistic way of thinking about beauty, I decided that I would create the system um, where I would photograph every single flower that bloomed over the course of the growing season. Uh, we have this shade garden, but we do have some really beautiful flowers, especially in early spring. So I turned myself over to the flowers. I would tell people that I was being accountable to the flowers. They would determine when I would make the pictures. And it was like a relinquishing of control of myself to them. So they would be the ones that told me when I would make make some art. Um, I felt like this really resonated with the experience of caring for an infant. Um, they do not abide by any clock uh, except for their own. And you may want to have you know, other plans for the day, but if they don't want to do what it, that is, they're in charge. Um, so I really started to find my rela relationship to time changing. Um, as the seasons unfolded, and one flower would bloom and the next would come, um, they were also working on their own clock. So there was this deep resonance between the garden and my, my child. What was exciting too was that once I cut a flower, once a flower bloomed from the garden, once I cut it, then I had this other time pressure to make the work. So I was able to use the flowers also as an excuse to squeeze out studio time. So, you know, if, if I had this bouquet, I might have to, to go that day down to the studio. And so that would become a way for me to leverage some, some, some help and excuse for the studio. 
I have, I had much smaller windows of studio time. And so I had to be much more efficient. So turning myself over both to the garden and my child really resonated with something Raka Edinger said when speaking about feminism. She said that feminism involved withdrawing in order to let the other have space. And I feel like that is so important for our culture right now. Um, and it also felt very resonant for me as an artist mother. In the very beginning of the miracle of mindfulness, Thich Han tells the story about a parent who um, came to him after they had had children and kind of was worn down and, and beat down. Um, and he said that, you know, he didn't have time like he used to now that he has kids and yes, he has the companionship and things like that, but it was really hard. But when he started to see the time he was spending his, with his children as time where he could be really present in the moment, everything shifted and he started to feel like he had endless time. And I just found this, this quote just recently, I was really excited about it. It's in the Miracle Mindfulness book, but um, I, it, that's how I felt. Like the more I was present with my child, the more time I actually had, which seemed counterintuitive. I began to think about these images fun functioning like a calendar. They're a calendar because of the flowers on blooming, um, but they're also a calendar because of the objects that were hanging around the house. Um, sometimes they would chart developmental milestones my child was achieving. You know, when you have kids around, you chart time very differently than you did before. Um, as I was pregnant, there was the weeks of, you know, first week, third trimester, all these things, these ways of dividing up time that I didn't really think about before. And then once they're out of your body, you're counting them in the two weeks and four weeks and eight weeks appointments at the pediatrician or the two hour feeding schedule. And so the way that my day was structured and the way that I was thinking about time was, was very different than I, than before. This picture is called self-soothing. Um, that is a moment when infants can soothe themselves, calm themselves and, and usually fall back asleep. And that becomes this huge moment of freedom for for a parent or a caretaker. I also found this really beautiful podcast uh, called On Being. And um, it's a podcast where a lot of different, really interesting people are interviewed. And this woman, Christine Runyon, she's a clinical professor and psychologist. Um, at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. She's also a certified mindfulness teacher. And she talked about how, um, I'll just read this quote from, from her interview. So although many self-care and mindfulness rituals may seem new agey or hippy dippy, these practices and rituals are grounded in the science of our nervous system. Breathing, attentive looking, paying attention to the sense we are feeling and being in the moment help to bypass our conscious thinking brain and help our nervous system slow down. This can help our brain and body to return to a state of calm rather than the fight or flight state of being. Um, so I love that. It's actually the science shows that it's about our nervous system um, and a different way to pay attention and take care of our, of our body. I also found this Henry Cartier-Bresson quote. Um, Many of you know Henry Cartier-Bresson. He's a famous photographer known for the idea of the decisive moment. Um, but I think this really relates to mindfulness too. So to take photographs is to hold one's breath when all faculties converge in the face of a fleeing reality. It is putting one's head, one eyes, and one's heart on the same axis. It is a way of freeing oneself. And then I found this really cool essay um, by Stephen Batchelor about secular Buddhism. Um, and here it is. As practices, both meditation and photography demand commitment, discipline, and technical skill. To go beyond mere expertise in either domain requires a capacity to see the world anew. Such seeing originates in a penetrating and insatiable curiosity about things. It entails recovering an innocent childlike wonder at life while suspending the adult's conviction that the world is simply the way it appears. The pursuit of meditation and photography leads away from a fascination with the extraordinary and back to a rediscovery of the ordinary. 
Meditative awareness is a heightened understanding and feeling for the concrete, sensuous events of daily existence. Likewise, the practice of photography has taught me to pay closer attention to what I see around me every day. Some of the most satisfying pictures I have taken have been of things in the immediate vicinity of where I live and work. And all of these quotes I found after I had already started on this um, way of working, uh, which I think is really directed at you students today, you know, I make you all research so that you can start to find those things that help you form language um, and back up the things that you're trying to do. So yeah, so this is my example of, of me doing, practicing what I preach, right? So both photography and meditation require an ability to focus steadily on what is happening in order to see more clearly. To see in this way involves a shifting to a frame of mind in which the habitual view of familiar and a self-evident world is replaced by a keen sense of the unprecedented and unrepeatable configuration of each moment. That is decisive moment, right? There, this moment kind of comes together before the camera. Whether you're paying atten mindful attention to the breath as you sit in meditation or whether you are composing an image in a viewfinder, you find yourself hovering before a fleeting, tantalizing reality. I'm sorry, I just have so many quotes here. I just love quotes. Okay, so while the meditator cultivates uninterrupted non-judgmental awareness of the moment, the photographer captures the moment and releasing the shutter. But in practice, the aesthetic decision to freeze an image on film crystallizes rather than interrupts the contemplative moment of observation. So that, that was super important to me. So there's this contemplative observation you're doing in the world when you're making pictures and the picture freezes it, crystallizes it on film. I love that. I love crystals, my students will tell you. Um, but aligning one's body and senses in those final microseconds before taking a picture momentarily heightens the intensity and immediacy of the image. When I take a picture, I use the large format camera um, most often, and that's a big, big old film camera. And you have to pull the dark slides out and cock the shutter and make your picture. And I found that I was always doing this thing where I would get everything ready and I'd have my hand on the shutter and I would take a few deep breaths, you know, just like, and I'd get my body and my breathing in sync with my stopwatch. And then at some, some moment I would be compelled to trip the shutter and that kind of breathing and focusing was exactly what was happening in, in my mindfulness practice. So there was this kind of synchronicity there. Um, and so the series I called Almanac for Shade Gardeners, um, I was thinking about uh, an almanac being this collection of information that's intended to be a guide. They, you know, al almanacs contain important dates and statistics, things about astronomy or tide tables, weather, when to plant things. Um, and I was thinking about mine being uh, a, an almanac for mothers, an almanac for mother artists, an almanac for gardeners, an almanac for someone having postpartum depression, um, and thinking about all the ways beyond the academic that knowledge is passed from one person to another. It would be tied to my autobiography um, and it would really kind of capture the joy and struggle of the unique time of isolation and separation that follows the birth of a child, the move to the suburbs, the settling in a house in a shade, shady forest, or the struggle to resist mainstream narratives. Um, in the art world, motherhood has been kind of frowned upon um, partially because of the legacy of 1970s feminism where women were trying to break away from domestic responsibilities and chart new territory as their own as artists um, and so a lot of the early feminists frowned upon motherhood um, rightfully so that was the time they were trying to break free of that um, but what that meant for me is that I didn't have any role models I could look to, to be like, here is the mother artist that I want to be like. Um, so I felt like as I'm making this work, it's important to share that this is, you know, coming from my experience of trying to find um, and resist the mainstream narratives of the art world. Mm -hmm. 
So as I embarked on this project, I uh, was critically an analyzing the status of motherhood within the art world, but I found camaraderie within art history in places that I didn't know of. Imogene Cunningham, a, a well-known photographer, turned to her photograph, to her garden after she had children. So these are her twins that she had in 1919. Um, and after that, she started photographing her garden. And there's that morning glory picture. It wasn't also just women who turned to their garden or to still lives in times of isolation at home. Many photographers made photographs, as photographic still lives as a way to remain creative under limited mobility. So the Czech photographer, Joseph Sudak, uh, he lost one of his arms in World War I. And after that, he worked in a small studio photographing eggs, bread, water glasses, and flowers in his studio window um, because that was something he could do independently by himself. Even the famous street photographer, Lee Friedlander, turned to photographing bouquets when he was housebound, housebound with knee pain. And these were bouquets his wife cut from uh, her garden that he would photograph. But most importantly, I found Ruth Asawa, um, and she has become like my champion. And this quote became like my, um, I had already been working this way, but it became like my mantra. And it is that you should do a little bit at a, at a time, a little bit at a time. It's important to learn how to use your small bits of time. All those begin to count up. It's not the long amounts of time that you have that are important. You should learn how to use your snatches of time when they are given to you. And I found out that Ruth uh, Asawa and Imogene Cunningham were friends and Imogene Cunningham had made these beautiful portraits of Ruth Asawa and her children. Um, I love that she is literally there weaving these basket forms, you know, with her kids and her studio was in her living room. And that was such an exciting thing. I think it's really important to think about um, different types of nurturing, care, caretaking. There's not just children and garden and artistic space. There's also teaching, right? Um, that's a form of nurturing that I am also deeply committed to. I think it's important to think about how caretaking, at least in the domestic context, has been historically performed by women and how being pulled in so many directions, um, it's no wonder that artist mothers are absent from the art historical record. For me and for many women right, living right now, um, the issue of juggling it all has been compounded by the pandemic. And I just wanted to share with you that um, the total number of women who have left the labor force since February, 2020 is more than 2.3 million. And so that statistic puts the women's labor force participation at 57%, which is the lowest it's been since 1988. So, you know, long before many of my students were born. So that's really intense to think about, like how do we create this work-life balance for artists, for mothers, for anyone um, who also has caretaking responsibilities. When I install these works, I think about the different sizes. Some of them are really big, some of them are really small. Um, for me, this represents the way that our memories or um, time may have different levels of significance. Some, oh, I'm gonna go back a couple, here we go. Okay, so some plants we planted, some the previous owners planted, and some like these black raspberries just showed up on their own. Um, this picture shows clovers that were um, picked by my child um, and earbuds that he destroyed. Uh, there's a black bandana that reminded me of my mom. I, she used to be a huge big Willie Nelson fan. Um, and so whenever I see bandanas, I think of that. Um, and I was also thinking about maternal knowledge and things that, you know, mothers share, share with you. Um, and in our family, raspberries are one of those things that we share. Uh, when I was a child, my mother put raspberries in our garden and raspberries like hold this really big significance for me, picking them off, you know, straight off of the bush as a child is one of my most important memories. And so when I bought this house, um, we planted raspberries outside too, but then these black raspberries, these came in, came in on their own. But my, I was talking to my mom about it and she told me that um, her grandmother had had raspberries. And so that's where it came from for her. 
um, was going to her grandmother's house and, and picking raspberries in the summertime made her want to put them in the, the garden. So I love thinking about these multi-generational um, knowledge systems held within the garden. Inspired by my lighting class that I teach at NIU, I changed the lighting techniques I use for this series. I wanted to show my students how you could uh, work with very inexpensive lighting equipment. So I bought the $75 light kit from Amazon. Um, and that's what I use for all of this series. And so I'll show you that in, in a minute. I started to really think about the actions and marks left by those that are non-human. Um, some of the plants would show up in our yard because of the feeding patterns of animals and birds depositing seeds. This image shows black walnut shells that were collected from inside my studio. So mice brought them into my studio in the winter. Um, and I started discovering little piles of them in different corners of the studio. But what I was really excited about was that in different piles, you could see that their mice were opening them in different ways. So there was some that were kind of gnawing around. So there was a perfectly halved walnut and those were all in one pile in one corner. And then in another corner, they were the ones where they had kind of gnawed through on multiple sides and they, they, they looked like they had little holes from multi sides. So I started to really pay attention to the ways that others beyond just me and my children and the, the garden were existing in this uh, ecosystem and space and thinking about influences that were not uh, traditionally considered uh, worthy of influencing artists um, or culture meaning family and nature and um, things that are non-human. I was really thinking about insignificance, things that are considered overlooked. Um, in the garden space, the overlooked is usually the weeds and our relationships to weeds really changed once we had kids since there wasn't as much time to weed as we had before. But this really was a blessing in disguise um, because we started to uh, really appreciate a lot of the native wild plants. Our neighbor has accused us of having a wild or natural look because we've let certain parts of our yard grow wild with native plants. But there's a really beautiful transition from the more cultivated plants in early spring to the, the wild plants that take over in fall, like the asters and uh, goldenrod and other plants. I just lost my train of thought of what the other ones were. Queen Anne's lace, that's what I was trying to say. Um, just like um, dust appears on film when it's scanned, um, like you might see in some of my other work, or colorful fragments of plastic would stand out on the sidewalk um, when I was making the work in the city. Each spring, the sprouts of our perennials emerge from the dark soil of hibernation. I decided that I would only photograph plants and flowers that had survived through the winter. To me, this really spoke of resilience and persistence. I like the idea of perennials um, and linking that with the resilience and persistence of artists, of mothers, of parents, of all those waiting in the shade, pushing against mainstream narratives. So these are, these are bleeding hearts. They're my favorite. They're like my spirit plant, um, or that's not an appropriate thing to say, right? They're my favorite plant, I'm sorry. Um, they capture my spirit in that they are just so beautiful and Ex like really strange looking, they're very alien. Um, they're much less showy than annuals. Um, and they've realized that perennials also have this connection to mechanical reproduction um, and therefore photography. So they're both copies year after year as the root of the plants act as a negative to produce a new flower in the image. So I love them. This was inspired by walking through the garden with my child. Uh, he picked the dandelion flower. Um, dandelion seems to be the, like the favorite flower of young kids. And when he was sucking on it, he thought it was a, like a straw since it was hollow. Um, so I put this still life together. Um, it has this little glass that I stole from a restaurant in Chicago um, when I was a wild young artist. Um, and the flowers are called fairy wings that we bought at a local store. 
I titled it Sippy, thinking about the Sippy Cup and how, you know, that wild uh, bohemian artist persona had, had shifted. Um, Winnicott, an English pediatrician and psychoanalyst who was especially influential in the field of object relations theory, um, talked about how children use stuffed animals as surrogates for a mother, um, representing uh, the maternal, like as a maternal stand-in. Um, what I think is so interesting about that is that on the one hand, it becomes, you know, a stuffed animal becomes a stand-in for the mother in this relationship with the child, but it also still is just a stuffed animal. Um, and so I was really thinking about specific specificity and contingency that these may be formal compositions, but they are also very specifically tied to my life. So if you look at this image, there is this towel that I bought at a thrift store because it was the same kind of towels my grandmother had when I was a child. Uh, the little orange square is a piece of tape off of my four by five box. The flower is a flower that one of my students gave to me um, that uh, when I moved into the house, she gave me some of the bulbs from her garden. And that little ribbon in the background is something I picked up on a walk in the forest preserve. So all of those things are tied to these personal experiences I have, and that way they're really particular and contingent, but they're also just formal elements here in the still life. And I love that kind of play with this work. I think it's also kind of funny and paradoxical to think about being present and the idea of presentness and um, cultivating a, a mindful attentiveness in the context of still life, because in art history, still life has a connection to vanitas and um, a composition that is was intended to get the viewer to reflect on the fleetingness of life and um, kind of reflect on the um, sense of grief or loss or mourning um, as life comes to an end. And so I see it as having this kind of paradox where on the one hand, it has that connection to traditional representational systems. But for me and for the viewer in the moment of viewing the photograph, there can be a presentness. And so there's a way it's like doing two things at once, which is kind of exciting to me. So this is the first one from 2020. And um, I thought that I would share with you some of my experience um, with that, because I think a lot of us, it, you know, traveling through the COVID experience for the last several years um, have had experiences that were very similar to what I experienced as a new parent. Um, all the isolation, the days at home, feeling kind of trapped and freaked out and scared and anxious. Um, that is how I felt as a, in the early days of having an infant. So I think some of the techniques that I, I developed can be very helpful for anyone. Um, this still life is called blood roots. Um, it's named for the plant you see there in the front. Um, there are short blooming spring flowers. They're common to Illinois woodlands. We have them in our front garden and in the woods behind our house. They're my partner's favorite flower we have in our garden. Um, they do have medicinal purposes, but they can be poisonous if, if poisonous if too much is consumed. Um, so it's an interesting um, plant about moderation. But it was also used as a dye, um, and I've started to explore dyeing a natural dyeing in my studio. But their blooming cycle is really short. It is just a couple weeks to one or two weeks. And the blossoms only stay open for one or two days and they only open when the sun is shining. Um, they close up their blooms at night and on cool and cloudy days. The flowers are so delicate too that one strong storm can blow all the petals off, leaving the dirt littered with white petals. 
Um, I've never been able to capture this plant until uh, 2020 because its blooming cycle happened so close to the end of our academic semester when I'm super busy with BFA thesis shows, MFA thesis shows, and um, going, you know, all the stuff at the end of the school year. So I've never been able to photograph these until 2020. Um, because when I get home, they're usually closed up for the night, even if, if it would have been a nice time to photograph them. So that was one of those um, being able to be home and appreciate the moment that you're in, even though there might be a chaos, chaos outside. So these are all from this time. Um, you know, during the pandemic, I was teaching online. I'm trying to <laughs> take care of my kids. I had a baby in, in June of 2020, our second child. So there was a lot of, of new additional pressures. Um, and this piece that's in the, the show, if you, if you go to see the, the show at the beginning, it's called homeschool. It really captured all of those competing, uh, dilemmas for us. Um, my oldest child was four, um, in 2020 and you can't really do preschool online. And, um, since I was teaching online, it didn't make sense to be, uh, driving out to, to help for his daycare. So we ended up having um, our kitchen transform into an artist studio, both for me and for him and a place where I could have meetings. And so this still life um, came out of that. It's called homeschool. And you, you can see little things I collected from our craft events, from our science experiments. Um, since he was no longer in school, I felt like I had to be making sure he was progressing and going to be ready for kindergarten after I was done teaching for the day. So we did all of these like really crazy intense um, science experiments. And so you'll start to see some of those coming out in my work um, over the next year. I have a, a show um, coming up in the fall that's gonna have a lot of uh, <laughs> the pandemic in it. Um, but so I, I thought at this point, I'd share some more of my actual techniques. Um, and these are the kind of, these are the steps that I go through. Basically, I build a collection through attentive looking. Um, so I'm always collecting things. Um, my students know this, we have this wonder cabinet in the, the lab, which is a place that we designated to put interesting things that we found. And I, I keep adding to it, even though we are, we've moved on from that. Um, the next step would be to find a stage. Uh, the stage could be any kind of platform where you want to collect and present uh, your interesting collection. And then I usually think about a background, an interesting but not overwhelming background. As you saw, my backgrounds kind of shifted through the work. There were some that were white sweeps. There were some that were colored. There were some that were really intensely dyed fabrics. Um, we like to tie dye, you know, tie dye season's coming up. So we'll be tie dyeing all summer long. So interesting, but not overwhelming background and then see the light. So pay attention to where the light is coming from on your objects. If you have a, access to a window, great. Um, if you don't, there's very reasonable um, lighting options for you uh, that I'm going to show you in a second. And then I like to use the rhizome as my compositional um, methodology too. I think about an aesthetic chain of events where one thing is the instigator and then the next thing comes after it and the next thing and they kind of branch off at one after the other. And then when you feel satisfied, you release the shutter and then you repeat and then you iterate, meaning change things around a little bit and then you repeat again. So, um, I'm going to get out of this PowerPoint. I'm going to stop my share for a second. Are people still there? Okay. People are still there. Not everybody left. Good. Good. And we're going to go over. So this is my studio. Um, you can see what, what interesting things do you want to see? This is a good thing for scale. You can see this is one of my still lifes. It's taller than me. I have all of this work that just came back from my gallery that I haven't properly inventoried and put away yet. Um, this is a piece I'm working on. It's got spore prints of mushrooms. Um, and I'm going to put these big googly eyes on it because googly eyes have become the material of choice. And then over there, I have some dark room set up. 
And over there are book books and co weird collections. And then there's my artist storage rack. And then on this side, you have sweeps, photo sweeps, and then a table full of supplies. But so what I thought I would do is show you kind of how I work like this. So I collected a few things from my studio, from my house and, and studio. Um, this is a quilt that was one of my great grandmothers. And I like to use um, these photo sweeps. They're just tripods with a little, um, they're called travel backdrop stands. They're like $200 or 80 to $200, depending on the brand. So they're not super expensive, but I use those for everything. And then these are the lights that I bought for $75. They're just CFL bulbs, but they came with tripods and um, there were three bulbs and umbrellas and little reflectors. So what I do usually is I pick something that's going to be my first, first thing. And I have a whole collection here of things that I just pull together to show you. So the first thing that I thought I would, I would work with today is this amazing log that I found out back um, that has this amazing lichen on it. Um, you know, like in our part plant, but also part mushroom. So they're like these cool hybrid creatures. Um, but there's all these beautiful lichen on it and moss of different kinds. Um, and it was like the perfect size to pick up and carry. So that would be as I'm composing, you know, there would be one thing that was like the main subject of the photograph. And then I would think about how the aesthetics of this um, could be um, highlighted. And so I thought this quilt would be great because the color of the quilt on the underside is kind of the same color as the lichen. So I like to do things where I kind of pair them together so that um, once the camera is seeing them, you have a, what is called a, a tangent, a photographic tangent, where the one point perspective of the camera can kind of trick you into blending them together. So once I have the camera out, that would be a moment for Kind of blending this together. And then oh, I usually compose with a still with my camera on a tripod um, because I like the relationship of moving things in the world to um, and seeing how they look on the picture plane um, and using that to help me decide. Not everybody works this way. Some people would just set the thing up and then um, bring their camera in. But I really like to respond to how the camera is working. So if I was to be using this as a picture, I'd get my camera positioned in the right place before I started moving things around. And then I, you know, kind of just, as I said, a, a chain of events, thinking about one thing leading to the next. Uh, I have this really great piece of dryer lint that was all turquoise, but like super bright turquoise. So I've been saving that for a long time but it kind of matches the, um, the turquoise in the, the quilt and that, that part. So I might, you know, put those things together. Um, this is a sunflower head I picked up on as I was walking my kindergartner to his first day of kindergarten. And, um, you know, I walked back and I was like crying cause it was so emotional. So this is <laughs> something I've been saving for the right moment. And um, so maybe that would come in. I really like to also play with height and balance. Um, so maybe I would bring in this like uh, cornstarch can container that I've been saving it for a while. And I like to look at those photographic tangents there um, and really play off of those. And then your color theory comes in. And normally I'm not talking this much when I'm composing, right? I'm talking a lot, telling you how I'm, I'm making this, but it's a much more quiet process for me where I am breathing and thinking. Sometimes I'm listening to music, um, but then I'm just really looking. So right now for you, I'm going a little bit fast, but it's usually a slower process where I would kind of sit with things and look at them and notice, um, do subtle movements around See what else I got over here. I 
I've never done this live on screen before. It's very surreal. Okay, so basically that's kind of what I do. I like figure out, and then I think about like, I would probably photograph like this. So I'm gonna get my little camera and I'm gonna make a picture really fast so that I have a document of this to share. Bring in my light, make it a little more dramatic. Joe was asking how we feel about teaching online. This is why teaching photography is hard online, because if you're leading a demo, then there's like kind of a lag <laughs> posted the music with it. Okay. Yeah. So that is, that's kind of my working process. Do you have questions at the moment? Do you want to try to make your own? If anyone wants to put questions in the chat or unmute yourself and go ahead and ask Jessica directly. You want to try? Well, I have, I have a few breathing exercises. If people want to try a breathing exercise, and then we could go make some pictures, um, and come back and share them. Anyone feel up for that? My students, I know you're like, not on a Saturday. I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> you're so dedicated. Anybody want to try? I could share on Tuesday. You have to run soon. Okay. You're gonna, you wanna do a breathing exercise, Amy? Okay. Yeah, okay. Those of you that have to go, this would be a great, great time to go. Let me share one more thing, one more thing with you. Hold on. Um, okay, let me, where's my screen share? Okay. Here's another one of these quotes I just found as I was like, a mindfulness for artists. So as artists, we learn to see in the moment, to use our eyes, to look for what is there in a sort of conscious perception. By fostering and eventually using this, visual information breaks through the veil of our mind and floods us with its immediacy. When we look consciously, we discover that nothing is ever the same. Everything around us, which we assume we have seen before is always and infinitely changing. Oh, I love that. It's like, everything is so exciting. The more you look at it. Okay. Well, I'm going to go back to my table where so you can see my crazy studio. Don't judge. It's very messy, but I was telling a student the other day that, um, I watched this documentary about creativity and they have done these studies that found that people are more creative if they have a messy desk, because what happens is there are unusual juxtapositions of objects that you might not um, traditionally see together if everything was in his place. So I think that's been very um, empowering for me and my artistic clutter. So. I thought we could do anchor breathing because um, anchor breathing also calls to mind a lot of um, visuals. So everybody get comfortable in your chair. I like to make sure that my feet are flat on the ground. Um, that grounding to the earth uh, is really helpful. And then I usually kind of sit up straight um, so that my chest can be unimpeded um, with my breathing. You can leave your eyes open or you can close them if you'd like. Imagine being on a boat, feeling calm and safe. Attached to the boat is an anchor. It keeps you there where you want and happy. Our bodies like the boat also have anchors and they can help us focus. Our belly, our nose, our mouth, and our chest and our lungs can help us feel grounded. 
With your hands on your chest, breathe in deeply. Breathe out slowly. Feel your ribs rise and fall. As your mind wanders, gently bring it back to the anchor point. Breathing in, you feel alive and awake. Breathing out, you feel relaxed and calm. On your final breath, lengthen the breath and breathe in deeply. Letting it out slowly, letting everything go. Okay, so this would be a great time to go collect objects because you are all feeling calm and present and attentive. Um, and I will stay here. If you want to go collect things and make a picture and share it in the chat, that would be super fun. I'll share my picture that I just made in the chat. Um, an easy way to do that is to email a picture from your phone to yourself um, and then just drop the file in the chat. There's a little icon um, there where you can um, it looks like a little folder. You can just, um, copy a file over for your, from your computer. So I'll hang around. If anyone wants to share a still life, I can give you a little mini, um, response. Um, we're, we're not calling things critiques anymore. We're calling them crits, which we're reframing as community responding and reading images and ideas together so that we're not thinking about being critical. We're thinking about really being present. So I'd be happy to give you a little crit on a still life picture if you wanted. But if not, thank you for joining me today. It's so good to see friendly, friendly names in the audience. I love it. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Give my little self a little kitty hands up. <laughs> this is one of my, my school props. I don't know where the other one went. So I've only got one right now. <laughs> People are gonna go make some some still lives. I hope so. I hope so. Do we set a time for how long we? Yeah, let's set a time. Um, let's take ten minutes. I'll play a song. Okay. How's that? So ten minutes. So at three ten, come back. I'm gonna turn off my camera, but I'll um I'll be here, and I'm gonna play a song for all of us.
Okay, everybody, that was a 10 minute song. So that 10 minutes is up. If you wanted to come back and join us. I took a few pictures, but I haven't gotten them emailed to myself yet. Okay, that's okay. And it, if you want to share, um, you can go ahead and try to get them over now, or you can share them with me later, or um, I can put my email in the chat and then let me just share my, oh, my picture. Who put them in already. Good. I know my photos, you know, they're so good. Tech savvy. <laughs> um, let's see here. There we go. Right, what I'm doing. Mine. <laughs> We're not judging. I mean, this is, there's no, no judgment, right? Like that is one of the whole things about mindfulness when you are like being aware of the thoughts and not putting a judgment on it. It's just being observant, being present in the moment. Okay, I'm going to download these that I've got. My file won't open. Oh. Okay, got to save it as a JPEG. Hold on. Explode. Sorry. I've never actually done it this way before. I had students share in the chat. Have you done this, Amy, very much? No, never. I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> we learn something new every day here. I know. I learned it at a different workshop. <laughs> <laughs> they made us all share things in the in the chat. I was like, oh my God, you can do that. Okay. Try again. Oh my gosh, these are so good, y'all. Oh my gosh, I love them. Okay, and I've got um, Michaela's and Amy's and I'm opening Drew's. There's sideways. Open mine. Amy, Michaela. So would, would you all be comfortable sharing a little bit about the objects that you chose? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'll start with mine um, since this is the still life. And um, so you saw me compose this and while we had our little break, I went back in and kind of tweaked the position of my camera. I put my camera more here in the center. Uh, that is always something that you should play with is how close the camera is to your subject, where it is in relationship, you know, thinking about the bird's eye view or the worm's eye view um, and trying a different angle. I also threw in this confetti um, that we had saved from New Year's because I felt like this area needed a little something else. So, yeah, that's my, I still have it turned out pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it actually. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Amy, can I share yours next? Yours made me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Do you want to tell us about any of the objects? Yeah, um, so I kind of went into it like intuitively with color. 
So I picked my first object was which was um, leftover broccoli from my lunch. Um, and then I started noticing green things around here. Um, so I have a bottle cap from a Sprite bottle that my partner had yesterday, um, a leaf that fell off my bonsai tree, um, a floss pick, and then this little alien, which you can't see, but he's riding a skateboard that I have, a little figurine, and then Pepper's poop bags when she goes to the bathroom. And then I knew from my background, I wanted something that contrasted the green. So I picked up this Valentine's Day dog themed um, dish towel that we have. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. That's so great. Did you tell me about your lighting too? I feel like you have a very nice soft lighting. It looks like yeah. natural light from the window or something. Yeah, I just have this window right here and I just kind of set up the towel like in the window. You can wait, you can kind of see where my towel is. I just kind of like stacked it on some bottles that I have sitting here, water bottles. And yeah, did it that way. That's wonderful. I love it. So great. Yeah. It, um, I love how it... Um, the red and green, you know, Im immediately make you think of complementary colors or Christmas, but you're kind of subverting that with the holiday, the Valentine's theme mm -hmm. and uh, the alien too. And I like how you're playing with scale in the image. Um, the, I'm going to pull it back up. The scale of the broccoli and the alien feel like they're kind of, um, of the same world. And it makes me think of when I was a kid and we would pretend the broccoli was trees. Um, and then that kind of gets flipped around with the bag where the bag starts to feel like a landscape, but then I start to pay attention to what each object is and appreciate them for what they are and see that their scale is not what I thought it was at first. Cause I was kind of swept into the illusion of the landscape you were taking. Totally. It's really great. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Would anyone like me to share their image next? Drew, can I share yours? Yeah, sure. Cool. Hi, Drew. Hello. <laughs> cool. Do you want to tell yeah. us about your objects? Yeah. So I just have a bunch of junk all over my desk at all times. So no wonder <laughs> you're are, so creative. <laughs> these are some of the things that have been sitting on my desk for a while. Um, well, first I'll start this receipt is just a jewel receipt. And I found myself just having a ton of receipts after working and I would always just set them on my desk. And so when we we're doing the Santa types, I was like, oh, what would happen if I put the chemicals on the receipt? And then I kind of forgot about it and just found it on the ground <laughs> like a while later. So that's how this ended up on my desk. And then just have this bottle that had Dr. Pepper jelly beans in them. Those are delicious. Uh, just a lighter and a camera battery. Uh, and then what else? Oh, and then just this slip. It's from work when we... Uh, have to list the file numbers for what course is going by that we're taking photos of. So, yeah. And then behind it all was this library book. <laughs> I just which, picked up. <laughs> which library book? <laughs> 40 or better than one. Oh. About the abstract artists I just picked up. <laughs> cool. I'm so intrigued by that receipt and I would love to see it underneath a microscope camera. There's something about that edge where the chemicals kind of are making a, a wavy line with the receipt numbers that feels so interesting. <laughs> it, I'm noticing a lot of um, numbers and patterns and things that kind of make me think of technology and commerce. Um, and the way that you've arranged them feels very minimal. Um, in some ways, it almost reminds me of, um, I just totally abstract painter, Joe. <laughs> what 
Mondrian. <laughs> like thinking about a grid and breaking a grid with primary colors of the red and the blue. You just need yellow in there to mm -hmm. kind of complete that reference. Yeah. But I like it. I'm, I'm seeing technological sublime influencing you here. Mm -hmm. We've been reading about that, Joe, in class. Oh. Yeah, strong geometrics. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, Michaela, can I share your image? Yeah, of course. Lost my Zoom. Hold on. This is so fun. Okay, you want to tell us about your objects? Yeah, so um, I feel like I always keep coming back to the brass knuckles, but um, there's something, I used to take a lot of walks at night and I don't do that anymore, but when I did, I would take these with me just to feel safe as a woman. So I wanted to play off that with the eyeliner and something that as a woman, I feel just makes me who I am. I'm very strong about my eyeliner um but i also wanted to play off the back to the brass knuckles because they are from my grandfather and so i wanted to play with the family ties so like the the little heart chocolate is from my grandma she still gives us valentine's day treats every year and then i have a picture with my family and um i don't know there's a lot to unpack with all of it but I feel like they all kind of relate together. And I struggle a lot with phone versus camera, so I'm not loving this. But yeah, I don't know. I think it could be something and grow from that. Yeah. Oh, I think this is wonderful. I love seeing um, the different generations in this, you know, and thinking about this ball of yarn feeling so like my grandmother and knitting or, you know, my aunt and knitting. Um, but then also it makes me think of young women knitting in my photography classes or, you know, someone else in our classes project where she's thinking about, um, craft arts and their tie to femininity. And so when you have that symbol looped through the um, brass knuckles, it feels really powerful. Like the, the you're like, you're reclaiming the yarn um, as a strength. Um, and I'm noticing a lot of dots and circles, um, kind of the repeating form through the knuckles and the ball and the faces and the portrait. Um, and the reds and the whites, um, it makes me think about, where were we talking about this? Beauty and strength or softness and strength and how, um, yeah. was that in our senior projects? I don't remember where we were talking about I that. Think I did like the hard and soft and like my hard self and soft. Yeah, which maybe, and here, here might be a thought about, um, I'm not sure what it is about camera versus phone that you're not into exactly I can relate but maybe there's something about the way that the depth of field is so shallow and the yarn starts to fall out of focus maybe that would be a way to kind of harness this technology to talk about these concepts of hard and soft or in focus or present and kind of out of focus and not so present um, that you have going on in this image I love it. It's awesome. <laughs> it's so fun to have you all making still lives. This is like great. Did you find it to be kind of relaxing or were you stressed out? A little bit, a little bit of both. Yeah. Cause we're here for this audience. Right. But I think like the more that you practice it, the more it could be like a way to generate ideas in a quick way you know, like quick ideas. Like you just made this really interesting still life that makes me think about the work you're making for senior projects. It, maybe it's even like a warm up or a way to take the pressure off. You know, you don't have to make something so final and resolved all the time. Anyone else want to share? Joe or Pat? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, do you have any questions or things you want to follow up about or talk more? Jessica, tell me again what CRIT stands for now. CRIT, we're talking about it as the community. So that's the C. Right. And then the R can be responding or reading because, okay. you know, reading the images is a big part of critique. And then the I is images or ideas because okay. those are kind of interchangeable. And then together is. Okay. So the community is responding and reading images and ideas together. Quite a change from the old days. From critique, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, there's the library, our library has this really great uh, book about critique that um, Pamela Frazier published a few years ago. And there's lots of people thinking about unpacking that space. And, um, you know, as I've been learning more about psychology and mindfulness techniques, someone said, that the um the mind that is feeling shame can't learn mm -hmm. and i feel like the critique experience in my experience there was a lot of shame and embarrassment and mm -hmm. you know like it was difficult so i want to figure out a way to flip that so i think the first part is well not the first part there's lots of ways that we i think are working at, about that in photography but i think the name critique is mm -hmm. part of the problem Person. Yeah. Well, anything else? Any other things people have questions about? I'm so grateful you all came on a Saturday. It's awesome. Well, if I, I could do my little spiel, I can let you know about our other upcoming programs if you're interested. All right. I want to thank. Professor Labat for doing this. This was delightful to get into your studio and see it all set up and see more of your work and really see more of that series. I've only seen like one or two pieces in faculty shows occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> so delightful to see it all. Um, just to let you know some of our other upcoming presentations, um, next week we'll be joined by Associate Professor Alexandra Giza sharing her observations while traveling the world of the powerful expressiveness of typography, and Associate Professor Billy Giza sharing a more local view through her mixed media and video work inspired by creating a suburban native habitat, supporting pollinators, birds, and other creatures. So she's also gardening. We'll have to I know. check each other out on that. And our final program will be joined by our history Associate Professor Helen Nagata, exploring the synaptic sparks where performance arts and woodblock print compositions meet. So we hope you'll be able to join us for these programs to view the exhibition. We are grateful for support from the Friends of the NIU Art Museum, funding from the Illinois Arts Council Agency and the NIU Arts and Culture Fee and the College of Visual and Performing Arts season presenting sponsor, Shaw Media. Thank you very much, Jessica. I really yeah, thanks, Joe. It. For you students who showed your work, bravo. <laughs> so good. Amazing. Thank you very much. This will eventually get posted to our website, and I'll send a little blip out so Jessica knows when it is. She can let people know. Okay. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks, you too. Bye. See you, everybody, next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>